And as our first speaker, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Tony Schill from Australia. He's a senior lecturer in Queensland. He's an exercise scientist, and he tells me don't uh, ask him any clinical questions, please. Um, he's a hamstring expert, worked with hamstrings intensively for six years now and published 19 peer-reviewed publications on the subject in the last six years. So uh, we're looking forward. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Pierre, for your kind introduction. And thanks also to the organisers for thinking of our group when thinking about sending out invitations. It's been a fantastic conference. I was told it was. Christian said this will be a fantastic conference. And uh, it's exceeded expectations by at least tenfold and uh, as a very narrow conference interval on that tenfold increase. So, obviously, we could answer this question by saying yes and finishing here because we have to be able to do better than we're doing at the moment in terms of reducing hamstring injuries out in the real world. I also was tempted to come here because I'm not travelling with my colleagues and take all the credit for their work, but I won't because many of you know them and so there's some really fantastic people here who do fantastic work and work really, really hard. And uh, this is the starting five of our team over the last six years or so. Uh, we work on a model and it's just a work in progress. There's nothing proven. Well, there's certain little aspects of it that are consistent with the evidence, but there's nothing proven about the model yet. But we're very interested in low eccentric strength and we're interested in muscle architecture, specifically fascicle lengths and the role that those two things play in hamstring strain injury. Of course, there are other factors, and we let colleagues who are far more expert at those do the research in that area. Although, we've had a dabble recently in load management in the AFL, and so we hope to have a publication very, very soon, hopefully before I get on the plane to go home, uh, in the load management or, or the uh, load fluctuations and hamstring strain injury in Australian rules football. So, with regards to the hamstring strains that we see, we mostly see high-speed sprinting type hamstring strains. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of them are high-speed, uh, sorry, not 80, but about anywhere between 70 and 80 percent are high-speed running injuries. And a vast majority, eight or nine out of ten of them, happen to the bicep femoris longhead. So it's almost true to say that we're not hamstring researchers, we're bicep fem longhead researchers. But one or two times out of ten, we're wrong, and we have to pretend to care about the medial hamstrings. So we've also published some work in the past about persistent neuromuscular inhibition, which we believe can explain a lot of the deficits, not just in strength, but also in architecture and fascicle lengths after an injury, at least if the injury is severe enough. Of course, there are other factors as well. I'm going to talk mostly about the things in red today. Uh, we're going to share with you some recent, re very recently published prospective work in A-League soccer in Australia. And then I'm going to talk to you about some as yet unpublished work of one of my PhD students, Matthew Bourne. And we're trying to basically give an evidence base that is better than the current evidence base for exercise selection. So I'm going to talk about the red stuff. So we've published at this stage three prospective studies one in the AFL, which has been out for a little while despite the date there. MSSE takes a long time to get you into, into print. Uh, we've a rugby study and we have an A-League soccer study, which is your round ball football, but I can't bring myself to call it football because I get confused. I'm going to talk to you about the soccer study today and the results from the soccer study from a strength perspective are very, very much like the AFL results and the rugby study differs a little and I'll tell you briefly how it differs later. So let's talk about the A-League study first of all. With all of these studies, we have a basic oversimplification of the methods. We look for injury history. We then do this pre-season test of Nordic strength. And we basically have athletes do this Nordic exercise strapped into a device which measures force at the ankles. Uh, and I said, hopefully get it to work. You all know what a Nordic looks like anyway. Try and click on that. Apologies for the sound. So this is Mitchell Watt. He's a silver medalist in the Olympic long jump in, from London. 
He does a decent Nordic. If you watch how slowly and how gently he touches the ground. So behind him at the moment is Carly Beatty. She's a world champion, very, very recently crowned world champion in the IPC long jump. So while Mitch is doing the exercise, in this particular device, we have wireless transmission of force to a laptop. And so it's a crude and rude measurement of eccentric capacity. It's nowhere like a dynamometer, but it actually tells us some information that's useful. Now, the A-League soccer is our elite men's competition in Australia. These guys aren't as good as our women, but they actually get paid, and the women at the moment aren't getting paid, even though they're vastly superior to the men in terms of world rankings. But in this study, Ryan Timmons did this as part of his PhD, a very, very productive and wonderful PhD, which he did with David Opar in Melbourne. So we convinced eight teams to be a part of this study, but seven of them would do Nordics for us. One of them did not want to do Nordics. They were happy to do ultrasound and isometric tests. It tells you something of some of the barriers to participation in doing Nordic programs. You can see the statistics there, nine-tenths of these injuries are bicep femoris long head injuries. So we give each player a two-limb average for their Nordic strength. If you get 350 newtons on your left leg, 300 on your right, you're a 325 newton athlete. The rock-derived cutoff in this particular study comes out at 337 newtons, a bit of an arbitrary number, of course, but ultimately, if you are weaker than this, you are... Ah, oh, very excited. If you are weaker than this, you're four and a half times more likely to sustain an injury than if you're stronger than this. And interestingly, if you look at the, uh, the regression, essentially, as you move across the population, for every 10 newtons of extra strength, there are 9% fewer injuries. Now, 10 newtons of extra strength should be the strength gain you can get from just about a single session when you first start. So I'd just like you to imagine what the risk, in, the risk reduction would be if you got 50% stronger. Because I'll show you later, uh, 50 newtons stronger, sorry. I'll show you later, it's easy enough to get 100 newtons stronger in a group of uh, recreationally active athletes. So that was not novel. By the way, the AFL results were very, very similar to this. Instead of 4.4, we had a relative risk of 4.3. The stats down the bottom in the AFL study, they're identical. So AFL players and soccer players seem to behave rather similarly. But the most interesting thing about this study is that Ryan took ultrasound measurements at mid-thigh of 152 players, and there was one extra injury amongst this group. So basically what you can see there is a mid-hamstring, a mid-thigh ultrasound measurement. You've got the superficial aponeurosis, a, di a intermediate aponeurosis, a line drawn parallel with the fascicles there, and with some trigonometry, you estimate how long the thing is. So again, that's rude and crude, and it's an estimate, but ultimately it still gives us some information that we think is useful. Again, a rock-derived cutoff of 10.6 centimetres or thereabouts shows that athletes with longer fascicles are less likely to get injured, athletes with shorter fascicles, four times more likely to sustain a hamstring strain. And that's the first time that's been done. So it was very, very interesting to me that one particular prominent journal rejected this paper saying it wasn't uh, novel enough because we'd done the strength measurements before. So, you know, we moved on uh, and, and published it pretty soon afterwards anyway. And the most fascinating thing about this is that with every half centimetre increase in fascicle length across our population, we found a 74% reduction in injury rates. It's an amazing reward for something that you can induce quite quickly. So if we plot those two things together, we've got fascicle lengths here and Nordic strength here. We've got a lot of dots and crosses. The green dots show players who subsequently don't get an injury, and it tells you what their fascicle lengths and their Nordic strength was. The red crosses are guys who subsequently had an injury. And you can tell from this that down here, is not a good place to be. Up here is a pretty good place to be. And in fact, no one's up here, which is a bit frustrating to me, because I think uh, we're going to call this the quadrant of doom. And 39% of people sustain an injury there. And the quadrant of doom is not a good place to hang out. 
But if I knew a place that was called the Quadrant of Doom, I wouldn't want to he live here or here. It's just far too close to a bad place. So we'd like to see people a bit further away. If you've got long fascicles but you're weak, or if you have short fascicles but you're strong, your injury risk goes down. But ultimately, this is where you want to be. Okay, I don't have a smarty pants term for this particular quadrant. If someone can think of something really uh, imaginative, please tell me, because I'm looking for something. Uh, a 4% injury rate. It's pretty hard to get injured when you are strong and have long fascicles in the bicep femoris long head. Okay, another way to look at this, well, actually, actually one more thing I'll just tell you about. If strength is really a factor in injury, we're doing a very bad job in elite sport in Australia. I haven't shown it on this graph, but I have an 11-year-old daughter at home. She's 39 kilograms and she is 1 metre 52 in height and she gets 226 newtons of force, which puts her around here. I haven't measured her fascicle lengths yet. She's stronger than 20 of our cohort from the A-League. They're adult men. So a I told a colleague this and a colleague said, oh, what's her training background? I said, dude, she's 11. She's 11. She doesn't have a training background. Dad's machine comes home occasionally and uh, she jumps on it. She's had five goes at it in two years and this is the force she gets. So there's no reason why an adult man shouldn't be getting above 400 newtons. If we just knew how weak people were, we might do something about it. Now, this part, you don't see these figures in the publication. It's a British Journal of Sports Med publication, so it's extra things for coming to Colding. But here, this is not particularly scientific because I've just fitted this line by hand because it looks like it's in a nice place. And ultimately, from the equation of this line, we get this inner equation at the top. Craig Purdom was urging us to think multifactorially. That sounds very, very clever. I can think of two perhaps at once, so I'm thinking bifactorially. And if I can have an equation which tells me really simply how the two go together. Fascicle length plus your Nordic strength divided by 71. If it's above 15, you're here. If it's below 15, you're here. And I don't know whether that's, you know, the triangle of something terrible starting with, triangle of tragedy. And ultimately here, you're ninefold more likely to sustain an injury than if you're here. So we want to develop exercise programs that push people from here in that direction as far as possible. Some things to consider though, it's early days in this research. There have been a total of three prospective studies using Nordic strength and only one with the fascicle lengths. The two limb average in rugby union wasn't related to injury rates, but a limitation of this study, which we downplayed a little bit in the paper, is that we had elite and sub-elite players together and the sub-elite players have lesser exposure to injury risk. So that may be a problem here. What we did find here is that imbalance between limbs was a risk for injury and a 15 and a 20 percent increase of 15 to 20 percent imbalance between your left and your right limb was associated with a two and a half and a three and a half fold increased risk of injury. But there are future studies on the way so Dave Opar is sitting on a mountain of data he's redone the AFL study but now with GPS derived exposure data which will really fix up the major weakness of the earlier studies and That'll hopefully come out relatively soon. Dave doesn't muck around. We have a Nord board at Aspatar with Rod and his colleagues, and we've given the Nord board to them because, to my mind, the last thing I want to do is be the only person ever to say that the Nord board works. They have a 344 player study. They have had Nordic strength for all of them, and uh, Nickel is just hanging around, waiting too long to analyse that data. So, if you know Nickel, tell him to get his butt into gear, please. But we're very interested to see that. And there's a Nord board here with Thomas and Christian and Casper and it's collecting some data apparently, or it's an excuse to go to Spain, apparently. So that brings us to the exercise selection side of things, and a mantra for me will be that evidence trumps theory, and in this realm, there's a whole lot of theory. And I love theory, I think theories are really, really good, I've got several theories of my own, but uh, they're rubbish, and I'm not gonna share them with you unless I go on and try and substantiate whether the theory is uh, worthwhile. But evidence trumps theory. Some of these, one of these exercises has a lot of evidence behind it. One of them uh, has no evidence behind it, but it's really, really popular, especially in the rehab side of things, and it virtually doesn't involve any hamstring activation. So lunge away if you like. Ultimately, another of the exercises probably makes a lot of sense, but ultimately there isn't the evidence base. 
So if you read the literature, people say these sorts of things. My exercise is an open kinetic chain. And I think that's fantastic, but I've never seen any evidence that your muscle cares. In terms of injury prevention, if that's necessary, the Nordic shouldn't work. The Nordic does work, so it's time to think about your theory, not think about the evidence. Or actually notice the evidence and then get a new theory or get a new hobby. Move on to some other area of science if you don't like it. So I'm going to get rid of the kinetic chain because I really don't think it's that big a deal. Then there's assumptions about core stability and we do a disservice to everyone by letting our colleagues who advocate core stability get away with never coming up with any evidence. Sounds nice in theory, but someone's got to measure the thing and look at it prospectively and see that it's actually doing something first. So I'm going to get rid of that at the risk of offending people. I think muscle length is an important factor, but I think muscle length is a little less important than some other factors. I'll tell you about them in a minute. And I hate the idea that people say, oh, it's a functional exercise. Your exercise is not functional. And if someone says functional to me, I generally think, nah, it's not a conversation I want to have. And I say, congratulations, we'll see you later. I think that if three quarters of what we base our exercise selection on is assumption, it's little wonder that we have big problems. In the UEFA soccer, it's getting worse and worse with hamstring injuries. You've all, you know of this study. Three quarters of what we do is assumption. And we're not making the right assumptions by the looks of things. So what else do we have to choose from? We've got RCTs, a limited number, mainly on the Nordic. And that's a testament to the fantastic work that you guys are doing. Uh, I keep saying to people who say, well, they've only studied the, uh, the Nordic. They haven't studied something else. And I say, perhaps it's your job to study something else. Do an RCT. And I'm going to tell them today what they should do in terms which what exercise other than the Nordic they should select. So I'm trying to make it easy for them, but no one seems to want to take up the challenge. So I'm going to talk about these other factors as we go through. I'm going to mention to you that I think contraction mode is king and that muscle length is its servant. But there are people who think it's the other way around. So no one here needs me to summarize this, but you know I'm sucking up to the chair. So ultimately, the Nordic hamstring RCT is the most powerful things we've got. And it was lovely news to us when Jesper's study came along, because for a year and a half we were developing a thing, which I won't name, but because uh, yeah, it's a conflict of interest. But ultimately, we're developing a device to measure strength. And here's a study saying, if you do this exercise, you don't sustain injury anywhere near as often. And Nick van der Horst's study has come along, and I've taken the liberty of just combining the results. 1,500 players and there's a two-thirds reduction in injury rate in the people who do Nordics. Okay, so that evidence is apparently not good enough for some people, but if we could get a two-third reduction or even a one-third reduction in elite sport, we'd be very, very happy. We talk to a lot of elite people in sp elite sporting teams, and they're fearful of, some of them are fearful of soreness. They're really frightened of soreness. We get the physios doing three Nordics and getting sore, and he then decides that a certain elite EPL team, one of the very, very top teams, is not going to do uh, testing on the Nordic in season because the players will get sore too, he's sure of it, because his 38-year-old hamstrings that have never done a Nordic got sore. So the fear of soreness is a problem and some people haven't heard much about the repeated bout effect. I think the repeated bout effect's been around for a long, long time. I can you know, remember citations from the 40s about it. I'm sure there's earlier stuff. Other teams that have lot nice low injury rates, they're generally characterised by no fear of soreness because they got over it in the first week of pre-season and they moved on, which the RCTs have shown. Soreness levels are quite low throughout these nicely progressed studies. People complain it's not functional, so I'm not talking to them anymore. I think players are too busy doing planks in the conception that this is going to help their core. The FIFA 11 program tells them, go do these planks. I personally suspect they might not be high enough intensity to actually help people with dynamic movements where people are really moving fast and hard. But, you know, it remains to be seen that doing these helps. But the FIFA 11 says to do them, and therefore you've got lots of evidence for doing Nordics, and I know the Nordics are in there, but the teams don't necessarily follow the FIFA 11 exactly, and you've got very limited evidence for planking, and people are spending the same time doing each. Okay, so Christian and Rod and I have a particular love affair for one particular US guru who just hates Nordics. 
And he says that it causes neural confusion. And that is the most scientific criticism we've had of the Nordic, from him at least. And uh, I think that, you know, these people are influential. They're far more influential than me. I mean, you just look at their Twitter following. There's tens of thousands of people following their information. And they tried the Nordics in the 60s and a couple of them got hurt. So it's anecdotal evidence that Nordics are nasty. Nordics are nasty. If you want to do five sets of 10 Nordics today and we sprint to the train station later, especially after last night, most of you are going to pull up very, very lame before you get to the front door. But even in the literature, we're allowing people to make these sorts of comments. Okay, so this paper, it's not all bad, but I still hate it, because they're allowed to say, we should do open kinetic chains. They're preferred. And I'd like to know about who. Clearly, the authors prefer them. Why would you prefer it on the basis of evidence? And also, the Nordic hamstring simply doesn't stretch the hamstrings enough. Can't work. It's just the, similar to the argument about the bumblebee, it can't fly. Its aerodynamics are wrong, it can't fly. So the next time one flies into your eye, you know, just don't wipe your eye because it didn't happen. Okay. The Nordic hamstring exercise doesn't stretch the hamstrings very far. I don't think it matters because contraction mode is king and range of motion is its servant. It's the servant that serves the other servants, in my view, in terms of modulating hamstrings. So Ryan Timmons, as part of his very productive PhD, is a guy who never sleeps, he conducted a nice study to establish this. He looked at contraction mode uh, on a dynamometer, he trained one group of guys eccentrically, one group of guys concentrically. He measured their bicep femoris fascicle lengths and he's published his reliability with that. He's gotten pretty good at it. And with eccentric conditioning, fascicles became longer very quickly. With concentric conditioning, it's a slightly slower response, but they became shorter. So here's a study where long length concentric contractions shortens the fascicles in this muscle that we blow out most when we strain. Contraction mode with the hamstrings anyway has these opposite effects. So this brings me back to Matthew Bourne's work. So Matty works with me in Brisbane, Dave and Ryan work down in Melbourne and we have this sort of healthy rivalry, but we're working at other ends of the, the bookshelf, if you like, to hold up uh, some evidence between them. And so Matt's work has his last portion of his study, after doing the rugby study, and another, one other, which I haven't mentioned, he has this three-phase study. The first one starts out with an EMG study, and I'm not going to tell you anything about it. And the reason I won't tell you anything about it is I think it's almost a crime nowadays to do a surface EMG study and then stop and then say, oh, look what we've done. We know the voltage across the skin in 10 different hamstring exercises. And the voltage across the skin is totally meaningless. You have to understand the mechanical events that are going on whilst that voltage is crossing across the skin. And if you understand that, then perhaps you'll have a clue about adaptation. So we just simply use this Nordic, uh, this uh, EMG study, to find the exercise that most selectively activated the lateral hamstring. And it turned out to be this one a 45 degree hip extension in a Roman chair with some weight held on your chest. That's a really selective activator of the lateral hammies according to our EMG. I know everyone else who does EMG gets a different result. The Nordic, it was the most selective activator of the medial hamstring. So straight away, if you're a critic of the Nordic, you'll go, ha ha, told you. But it actually also had the highest activation of the lateral hamstrings. Don't get ratios confused with absolute amounts. This is a tough exercise. And as a consequence, there's very high lateral EMG as well, but the emphasis is on the medial in terms of activation. But anyway, EMG has a lot of flaws. So we've done an fMRI study to look further, closer, and then we did a training study to actually look at adaptation. So I think every surface EMG study should be followed by at least one of these, or at least the third step. And it should be made a crime that you just do the surface EMG study and stop. So with our fMRI study, you can read the details there, but ultimately people came into the lab and they performed one of these two exercises. They rest for 15 minutes, we scan them. They do the exercise, we scan them again. Within 90 seconds of their finishing the exercise, they're back in the tube. We look at regions of interest, as big as we can make them within the hamstring muscles, and we basically get a, a, a composite average of the T2 changes. Now, not many people understand T2 changes. To be frank, it's rocket science. I don't understand them much, but I think I can interpret them reasonably well. 
That's a resting MRI, T2 scan. It's not a nice anatomical one. It's a bit blurry compared to your T1s that you guys will often see. You can see the, every muscle is black because they've been inactive for the last 15 minutes. After 50 reps of Nordics, they go boom, and the semitendinosus goes boom. And notice that not just the color change, notice that the whole leg lifts up off the bench and rotates externally a bit. It's because of the fluid that pumps into the hamstrings. Their volume has gone up as a consequence of this exercise. Semitendinosus lights up like a Christmas tree. Bicep femoris short head lights up like a poor man's Christmas tree. And the other long heads, they're just not really contributing a lot. They're not entering into the spirit of it. However, and so you can see the group averages here. Semitendinosus lights up much more than these others. Now, a lot of reviewers say to us, well, that's useless. You don't know what it means. I'm going to show you a graph later of muscle hypertrophy after 10 weeks of training with this exercise, and the pattern of muscle hypertrophy is indistinguishable from this. So within an exercise, if you get a lot of T2 response, you will get hypertrophy if you do enough of that work over a period of time. So I promise you I'll highlight it later. With hip extension, that's just the post-exercise scan, and you can see by, all of the long heads are quite well lit up. You can see, every time I press that it gets very excited, uh, you can see here more even activation from a T2 perspective. And I'll show you later, more even hypertrophy after 10 weeks of doing that exercise. So, the really important thing though is the training study. We wanted to know the effect of these two exercises on fascicle lengths and Nordic strength because we've associated those things with an increased risk of injury. We also wanted to look at muscle hamstring volumes as well because there is a little bit of evidence after a hamstring strain injury to bicep fem long head that there's some lingering and persistent atrophy of the bicep fem long head. Now, I don't know if that's an injury risk factor. I just hate the idea of atrophy going unfixed. It just sounds like a deficit that should be a crime and we should be able to fix it and we should know which exercise is the best thing to address that particular muscle's atrophy. So we were really looking interest, interested in those things. We flew Ryan in, he did his ultrasound measurements and we flew him back home quickly because he works too hard and makes the rest of us look bad. We have a device like this in the lab and so we can take forces from the load cells at 1,000 hertz, so we have left leg force, right leg force during a Nordic, that's what the force time profile looks like in a, a decent Nordic. We have the summed torque or force from both the limbs, and we have a goniometer which is not shown here, and the goniometer tells us about knee angle and also velocity. And then we take T1 MR images, we start on the iliac crest and we have one centimetre contiguous slices all the way down the thigh to the, till we can see the tibial plateau. And Matt spent a lot of his life, and he'll tell you all about it, he was not a happy camper, tracing all of these muscles so that we could work out the volume of these muscles pre and post training. So the timeline looks like that, all of those tests in week zero, all those tests again in week 11, Ultrasound done in the middle as well, because it's simple. You just fly Ryan in and point him in the direction of the ultrasound device. Ten weeks of training, two times a week. The allocation of individuals is 30 participants, 10 in each group, and the allocation is based on their fascicle lengths. So the owners of the three longest fascicles go into one of each of these groups, you know, in a pseudo-random fashion, because, of course, once you randomise the first guy in, you can't randomise anyone else in there, so it's pseudo-random. The fourth, fifth, and sixth longest fascicles are dealt with the same way. Now, in terms of blinding, blinding is vitally important in this, so I had to conspire to blind people as well as possible. Ryan is a fly-in, fly-out ultrasonographer, and as a consequence, he knows nothing about group allocation. I conducted the strength tests, and I didn't do anything in the lab in terms of training people. I just said, that's beneath me. You wouldn't want me doing that. And then... Matty did the scans, and in the post-exercise scans, I colluded with the radiographer to code those. And Matty had to come up with all the results and show me the results, and then I re-identified the people. So importantly, there's uh, blinding going on in each of these elements. So the participants are unspectacular. They're young, they're recreationally active men. They typically play soccer or AFL football or rugby, but at a lower level. They train once or twice a week and play their game on a Saturday. 
This is the training program. It's nasty. It's a lot of volume. And Matt, uh, it's his PhD, so at the end of the day, we let him have his head. He was troubled by training twice a week because in some of these interventions, you guys use three times a week. And he wanted the same volume, despite the fact that we were in the gym one less off, once, uh, once less often per week. So he wanted to hit them hard. And I thought, oh, okay. You know, you hit them hard. We loaded these guys in a different way than some of the other studies in that when a person could control a Nordic all the way to the ground and not hit the ground, they could just stop and hover, we gave them a small weight on their chest, two and a half kilograms, and we increased that increment over time. I'll show you a video later, it's pretty mean. Now, it's not a result, but soreness was modest. Right throughout, soreness was modest here, as it was for uh, Jesper Peterson's study and as it was for Nick van der Horst's study. People are not incapacitated as a consequence of these exercises. Now, training. So down under, this is what a Nordic looks like after eight weeks of training, or in the eighth week of training. That's a 20 kilogram plate. And here's a guy with the biggest semitendinosis we'd ever seen under ultrasound. Okay, so he does six reps in this particular session, six sets of six. By the way, at the end of the study, after the study, this guy could do six sets of six concentric Nordics. We didn't let him do that in the study. Notice that he is getting up from the bottom position with minimal knee flexor activity. It's all about just pushing himself back up into that position. So very glad there wasn't any swearing. I was trying to dull the sound before. Now, hip extension looks a little different. It's more conventional because there's a concentric and an eccentric phase. Now, apologies, the lumbar spine doesn't look great. <laughs> Train one leg at a time. Okay, so he would then dump that weight, rest for 30 seconds, pick it up again. The hardest part for our participants in this thing, we had some 70 kilogram guys, 75 kilogram guys holding 70 kilograms on their chest. We also had a little bit of knee pain so whilst I like the idea of this hip exercise, we had a little knee pain because your, your knee goes into hyperextension here. What this guy should be doing, should be standing behind the participant, pushing really hard into the back of the knee just to take the knee off absolute full extension a little. And we had one particular, participant, uh, one particular research assistant who was fantastic at that, is a 160 kilogram taekwondo athlete, and he just was pushed with one hand, and if there's another guy in the gym, he would push with his other hand, uh, and he could keep the, a little bit of knee pain away. So, if some of the theoreticians are correct, this exercise, which has much more excursion than the Nordic, should result in longer fascicle lengths. But the results don't quite pan out that way. So here are our fascicle length results. In red, the Nordic. These fascicles got longer and they kept getting longer. I was surprised because I thought they would plateau off and stop getting longer. It, that certainly happened in Ryan Timmons' isokinetic dynamometry study. But what we also have is we have guys who initially are reaching peak torques at around 45 degrees from the ground, and at the end, five degrees from the ground. They just stop there. So they're probably getting a stimulus out to longer and longer muscle lengths. Muscle length is a servant, it's got a role, but contraction mode seems really important here. They're both statistically significant effects though. The hip extension causes a nice increase in fascicle lengths, if you remember, a one half a centimetre increase in fascicle length was associated with a 74% reduction in injury rates in our A-League players. So I can't even calculate how big the reduction in injury risk might be because of this. Now, statistically, there isn't a difference between these groups. We're a fraction underpowered for that. But if your hypothesis was that the hip extension would result in greater fascicle lengthening, then we've shown that that's not true. So, with the strengths data, I was a little surprised to see this. Both groups got stupidly strong. They improved their Nordic strength by 100 to 110 Newtons. We made some monsters. And at the end of it, they're all showing off. They go down to the gym and do their concentric Nordics for sets of six and just show their friends. And it just went around town. What have these berserkers been doing? But you got seriously good at Nordics, even if you did hip extension. And so, you can get strong a number of ways. 
and you would reduce your injury risk. This is just our test. Of course, this test is biased. It should be biased towards the guys that do Nordics. We have other aspects of the study, like we have a hip extension strength measurement as well, but I'm, I'm not sharing that with you today because it would take too long. So if we plot these things, we're going back to the scatter plot that I showed you earlier. There's a quadrant of doom again. And you can see prior to training, some of our participants are in the quadrant of doom. The other guys are outside of, but they're not very far from the quadrant of doom. And they don't even know it's scary. Okay, but we're scared on their behalf. And after training, oh, and by the way, that's the A-League averages. Because, yeah, we're constantly told, and I know you guys hear it as well, our beasts are more elite than your beasts. And therefore, the training that works for your guys can't work for us. Our guys, on average, they're recreational guys, and they're stronger than the A-League players in Australia. Their fascicles are about half a centimetre shorter prior to training. So there's not a lot of difference. After training, there's an exodus. You can tell which direction they're all going. They're all heading diagonally up and oh, across the page. And what we can see here, interestingly, from my perspective, you know, if you uh, combine these results into that in equation I showed you earlier, this guy up here, remember that above 15 gave you a you know, ninefold less risk of injury? This guy gets a score of 20, 20.5. His risk of injury, if you put it back into the A-League results, is about 0.03%. If a piano falls from the sky, he might get a hamstring strain. But interestingly, out of the eight owners of the longest fascicles, seven came from the Nordic group. Prior to training, the ranking is nowhere near like that. So the Nordic uh, response to Nordics is a very steep rise. The response to hip extension is a slightly less steep rise. I think both are great. But we go from there to there, and we're a long way away from this dude, but except obviously the control participants are left behind. So in terms of volume, muscle volume changes are interesting. Remember I said before, acute T2 responses are very reflective of chronic long-term uh, muscle hypertrophy. So if we look at our muscle volume measures, in red, the effect of Nordics, semitendinosus grows so rapidly, 21%, or beyond 20% increase in volume. Bicep fem shorthead, the next most. And by the way, I was crunching some numbers in the plane. And the best predictor in terms of muscle volume of your Nordic strength is semitendinosus size. The second best predictor, bicep femoris shorthead size. You can see rather less hypertrophy of bicep fem long head and semimembranosis. With the hip extension, a more even hypertrophy across all of the muscles. Even the short head grew significantly, and I suspect it's because it was working very, very hard to try and help stop people get into that hyperextended position, so I think it's working isometrically. Now, the one difference between the exercises that's statistically significant is the difference in bicep fem long head hypertrophy. And that favours the hip extension group. So what do we think uh, about those results? Both these exercises had good effects on two things in red, which we think contribute to your injury risk. So I'm happy to use both of them. I'm happy to use other hip extension alternatives my issue is I can't measure the, the force levels there as easily, or the knee torques, or can't, the hip torques. They're probably influenced by a whole heap of very big muscles other than the hamstrings. They both increase the volume of semitendinosus and bicep fem short head. I suspect that this exercise is a great candidate for an RCT, so if you hate the fact that there's only evidence for the Nordic, this is your baby, run with this, or run with a close alternative. If you could get the, the pad, rather than put it behind the ankles, put it behind the knee, I used a machine like that once in Sweden. I've never found it again. I've got to go back to Sweden and, and try and buy it off the gym. But ultimately, I think this would be a good candidate for an RCT if you can avoid the knee pain. So someone's got to do that. And then uh, I think because it increases bicep fem, uh, sorry, yeah, bicep fem long head volume, I think that would be an excellent exercise of choice for rehabilitation as well. So clearly, people want to choose hip-based movements and knee-based movements, and now we can see that they're similar in certain ways and they differ in certain ways. Greater excursion does not result in greater fascicle lengthening. There's evidence. So next time someone tells you there's not enough elongation stress, 
in an exercise, I mean, you know for straight away, if you have to invent a new term to describe length, then you're stretching it a bit. Contraction mode is king. I put a question mark there because I'm trying to be polite, but I think it's king. I think the length is its servant. I think this exercise could be more effective if it's eccentrically biased. So if we were to lower the weight with one leg and lift it with two, we would bias the eccentric phase and make that phase hard. I think that would make this then a little more effective again. And indeed, we'll probably do that study at some stage. Matt's finished his PhD, I've got to find someone else as a sucker for punishment. The modest hypertrophic effects, because again, if you don't like Nordics, you'll say, ah, oh, it didn't cause much hypertrophy. But we don't know that hypertrophy or volume is a risk factor. And the modest effects on volume don't change fascicle length increases. You can increase fascicle lengths enormously without making the muscle overly big. And I agree entirely with the folk, the detractors of the Nordic who say, it's not functional. It's not. It's structural, and structure matters. And in sports medicine, I think we want, we're all clever. We're all clever people. We realize that the whole problem's not in here. But I think we've actually run away from there and started to neglect what's going on in here. So I'm not that clever. I'm not getting too far away from in here. And that's where we've found some nice evidence, I think, for why the Nordics have worked so well in two big RCTs and quite a number now of non-randomized control trials. Okay, so I want to show you a picture of Dave Opar when he was young. So I recruited him out of the creche, and uh, we've been around the world a little bit. We had a bit of fun. The boys met Rafa in Monaco, and I didn't get to meet him because I had a bit of belly problems, and I was being sick in this hotel behind him. They came in and said, we just met Rafa, and I said, bullshit. And then they showed me this photo, so I was devastated because he's my favorite tennis player. But anyway, thank you very much.